Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so welcome again to, to this, uh, today's Mendel Lecture. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Matthias Henze today. Uh, Professor Henze uh, is by training a medical doctor. He has uh, studied at several institutions, originally in Münster, Germany, and then also at uh, um, Southampton in the UK, at Cambridge, Oxford, Glasgow. And then he moved to the US, to NIH, to Bethesda, where he was for five years a visiting researcher, something like a postdoc uh, that we would call today, but he did it without a PhD, <laughs> as I learned now. So uh, it's a message that uh, you can become a renowned and successful scientist even without a PhD. That doesn't mean that our students should stop by now. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so after completing this postdoctoral state at the NIH, he, was, uh, he accepted a position at the EMBL, where uh, he has been since now. And uh, during his years, uh, he, has, uh, uh, he was awarded num numerous awards. I would mention some. For instance, the most prestigious German prize, the Leibniz Prize in 2000. He is an elected uh, EMBO member. He also uh, was, uh, became a member of the German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina. That's yet another distinguished uh, uh, selection. Uh, and then he is a member of uh, other uh, international and German uh, uh, um, uh, boards and uh, academias. And uh, uh, most importantly, since 2013, uh, he became a director of the EMBL uh, in Heidelberg. And uh, you will hear today uh, what has been his uh, scientific uh, interests, uh, how we know him, that he is one of the leading scientists who has uh, contributed to our knowledge of RNA binding proteins and has uh, discovered uh, quite unexpected roles of uh, proteins that one would not originally link to RNA metabolism. So, uh, Professor Hansa, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming and we are looking forward to your talk. Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's, uh, it's amazing to see such a full audience that is immediately a lot of uh, stimulation uh, to give a good talk. Uh, thank you, Stepanka, for the invitation to come here. It's actually quite an honor uh, to give a Mendel lecture in this beautiful and historical uh, surrounding. Uh, and not only in the 200th uh, year of uh, Mendel's uh, birth, but uh, actually, I think to the day, uh, three months after his uh, his actual birthday. So a very special occasion uh, for me, and it's fantastic uh, to be here. Thank you. Uh, so um, what I want to do today is uh, take the following perspective. I assume that with very few exceptions amongst you, you will not have heard or read about riboregulation. I don't expect that. Um, but by the end of my presentation, I hope that quite many of you will not only say, oh, that makes sense, um, but that actually some of you will walk home and think, I wonder whether this affects the biology that I'm personally interested in. That is my ambitious goal um, for what's coming. Okay, so let me get things moving here. Was all looking great a moment ago. Yeah, and it looks great now. Perfect. So, um, now it's gone and back. Okay, so this is this riboregulation that I want to make you uh, wonder about and, uh, and, uh, and get excited about. So what's the starting point? Imagine somebody has developed a totally new surveying instrument for surveying planet Earth. You know, some form of a drone or satellite or whatever. And although we all think we know planet Earth extremely well, Suddenly, with this new instrument, they tell us there is a new continent. So on this slide, you know, it's this continent, Zelandia, uh, which has actually been implicated as a continent that's also, you know, underwater. 
So this is exactly the kind of situation that you know, we encountered with RNA binding proteins, as I will tell you in a moment. If somebody would tell you that, or if you were the person making that observation, you would first wonder, well, maybe something is wrong with my instrument. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe this is a false positive. I think as prudent scientists, that's what we all need to do. Um, and if you eventually learn that you know, this truly exists, you obviously wonder what the meaning of it is. So let me then jump from this to our subject of study, RNA binding proteins. So sometime around 2010 or so, after we had been studying RNA binding proteins for some 20 years, I would say nowadays you would say classical approaches, biochemistry, based on a, on a um, you know, model system, on a model gene, and extrapolating from the biochemistry that you learned from this into sort of general mechanisms, we started to wonder whether there was a way to find out what all the RNA binding proteins in a human cell or in other cells might be. In other words, to develop an omics approach to the discovery of RNA binding proteins. And at that point, roughly 700, give or take, RNA binding proteins were known that had been collected over some 30 years or so of study, um, in some cases one by one, using biochemistry, using genetics, using all the tools um, you know, that we know. But then, uh, in order to try to find such a method, um, Alfredo Castello, a postdoc uh, in the lab at the time, um, you know, developed the following very simple approach, and that's one of the things I love about molecular biology. In molecular biology, I think it sometimes takes relatively simple tools or combinations of new combinations of relatively simple tools to make progress. So in this case, it was the use of UV cross-linking, meaning you take cultured cells, HeLa cells initially, you shine a 254 nanometer UV light onto those cultured cells, and the UV light will introduce covalent bond formation between proteins and single-stranded nucleic acids, such as RNA, um, if the two are immediately touching each other. Whoops. I can still see it here on my computer screen. There we are. Um, okay, so you basically this asterisk here is the covalent bond, and the red ball is the RNA binding protein of interest. And the, and the gray balls are indirect RNA binders. They are not direct RNA binding proteins. They're engaging protein-protein interactions. So we are not interested in these. And so what is done is, um, you know, you lyse the cells, um, and then you make use of... Um, for some reason, this connection doesn't seem to be so stable. Okay, good. Let's hope your magic touch, Stepan, has done the trick. <laughs> uh, I don't want to f <laughs> have you sit like this all the time. That would be quite a sportive exercise. Anyway, uh, let me m maybe I should give my talk in five minutes. Um, so, uh, so in any case, so after, after lysis of cells with the, this protein of interest now being denatured, hence the ball has turned into a sausage, um, the, um, you know, cross-linked to RNA, polyadenylated RNAs are pulled out um, on oligo-DT beads um, and very stringently washed to get rid of everything that isn't covalently bound. And then um, the RNA binding proteins, the red sausages, are released by RNA treatment, subjected to mass spectrometry, and that would give you, uh, you know, the list of all proteins that were cross-linkably bound to RNA, to polyadenylated RNA, um, at the time the UV light was shown. And the outcome of that, and now I'm integrating uh, you know, some experiments, not just talking about a single experiment, was very surprising. Hence, you know, my original analogy with the surveying instrument of planet Earth. 
So, uh, you know, from the, uh, you know, seven or 800 that we would have known about, uh, it turned out that there is about maybe a thousand uh, proteins that were identified that have uh, recognizable by the computer RNA binding domains. And hence, there is a logic, you know, the, um, why these proteins might bind RNA because they have architectural features that typically can bind to RNA. And for many of these proteins, of course, we knew them already. There were the positive controls. We know that they bind to RNA, and when they bind to RNA, they change some aspects of the RNAs they are bound to. They might change the stability or the processing or the translation or the localization or what have you. Uh, so it was interesting to find additional ones but that wasn't the big surprise. The big surprise is here on the right-hand side. There was at least another thousand or more that were extremely well-known proteins in cell biology. I'll give you some examples soon. But there was absolutely no reason why they should be binding RNA. Neither the biology that was known about them linked them to RNA metabolism, nor did they have architectural features, known RNA binding domains, that would explain why they bind to RNA. And so this was when we got very worried and thought that maybe we're dealing with false positives here. Many of these proteins are quite abundant proteins, such as enzymes, metabolic enzymes, as you will see in a few moments. But um, it then uh, dawned on us, and that will be the um, subject um, of this afternoon, that when proteins and RNA interact, it doesn't necessarily have to be that the, uh, that the protein acts on the RNA and controls RNA expression, as we all very well know, but uh, that RNAs could bind to proteins and directly change protein functions in this way. Just as you are all very well familiar that post-translational modifications can change RNA functions. Protein-protein interactions can change protein functions. So this will be the subject of my talk. And with this, I show you just a summary of published work um, that was actually the first example that we studied in detail. And the way we chose this example, you know, what, if you have over a thousand, you know, you have a lot of choice. How do you make that choice? So we decided that because our worry was that we are, might be dealing, if we are unlucky or have not done well, with false positives, or even if biochemically there are true RNA binding proteins, what we really want to know is not about the biochemistry, it's about the function. You know, is this RNA protein interaction functionally relevant? And so the way the choice was made was we said, we want to choose something that is extremely deeply researched on, as evidenced by hundreds or thousands of publications in the literature on that protein. And when we do text mining on the published papers, there should be no evidence that this protein has been implicated in RNA biology before. And so the protein that we started to study is um, you know, this protein called P62, or also called sequestosome 1. It's a protein that plays an important role in mammalian autophagy in the following way. Um, uh, monomers of P62 in the cell are inactive in terms of autophagy. When there is an autophagy stimulus, such as starvation, then um, you know, P62 homomultimerizes, as indicated here. And these homomultimers are important to drive um, autophagic flux. So this protein we had noticed to be an RNA binding protein by our assays. And so we went on, and I will introduce with, uh, with the other example I'm going to discuss um, the technologies a little later. Um, we identified that P62 predominantly binds with high specificity a small non-coding RNA called Volt RNA 1-1. It's a tRNA-like um, RNA polymerase 3 transcript. And when Volt RNA 1-1 binds two monomers, it inhibits oligomerization. And therefore, it's an inhibitor 
of the autophagic function of P62. We also found that when a ph the physiological stimulus of autophagy, starvation, uh, is, um, is cells are subjected to starvation, that under those conditions, the steady state levels of Volt 1-1 go down and therefore also the amount of Volt 1-1 binding to P62 goes down, hence allowing um, monomers to oligomerize and drive autophagy forward. So this model, or the data behind this, they are in the paper that's on the bottom, raised three questions, probably raised more, but these are the three I quickly want to mention. How does a protein like P62 bind RNA? How does RNA binding regulate oligomerization that I just mentioned? And what makes Volt 1-1 so special? It's quite related to tRNAs, and the human genome has three other Volt RNAs, none of which can substitute for 1-1 for the function uh, that I just told you about. And the answers, at least some answers to those questions, are in the paper that just came out earlier this year and that I illustrate on this slide here. So, um, P62 is a protein that has multiple domains, and a very relevant uh, domain is the very N-terminal PB1 domain. The PB1 domain was already known to be important for oligomerization. And um, there are, uh, you know, in particular, two, two lysines, uh, 7 and 21, and a acidic patch called OPCA motif that are important for this, as you will see in a moment. Interestingly, we found that Volt 1 1 RNA binds to these two uh, lysines uh, in particular. When we mutagenize those, RNA binding of P62 is heavily diminished. In addition, binding of Volt 1 1 RNA to this region requires <coughs> what's labeled here as a central flexible loop of the 1-1 RNA, and the other Volt RNAs lack this particular flexible loop, explaining at least in part why there is specificity for exactly this pair. So then when uh, starvation happens, whoop, okay, when starvation happens, um, you know, Volt 1-1 RNA levels diminish, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and so the positively charged uh, regions and the negatively charged domains interact with one another and can drive oligomerization. In this paper, we also say, I won't go deeply into it, is that there's also, when a different form of, uh, of uh, cell stress, proteolytic stress, is applied, then cargo is not bound through the C-terminal region, but cargo can actually be loaded through the ZZ domain, and this loading of cargo seems to be dominant over Volt 1-1 binding. In other words, even though Volt 1-1 RNA levels are not changed under proteolytic stress, this form can expel the RNA. I'll leave this story at this point but, uh, you know, the, the message I want to drive home is that here we have an RNA that can, by specific binding to a protein, control an important aspect, function of the protein biology, riboregulate that function. And for that regulation to occur, it's controlling the levels of the RNA of a particular RNA in a highly specific RNA protein interaction. And I'm repeating all of this because I will want to contrast it with what comes next. This is an observation of what this slide depicts, an observation we made around 2015. And that was that, you know, with this RNA interactome capture uh, approaches, that nearly all glycolytic enzymes display RNA binding activity. And this applies to yeast enzymes as well as to mammalian enzymes. And it's indicated here by the green dots, uh, you know, yeast is uh, on the left, human is on the right, and uh, both are sort of in the middle, and you can see a lot of green dots. You don't need to remember all the positions. 
because the one example I'm picking out is uh, Enulase 1. Ina Huppertz, a postdoc in the lab at the time, picked Enulase 1. Um, she could have picked others, but she picked Enulase 1. Uh, the reason for her was that, uh, you know, Enulase 1 was one among several of uh, um, glycolytic enzymes where, you know, the RNA binding was conserved between yeast and human. So the first thing after validating RNA binding independently, the first thing that she was curious about is what is the RNA? You know, the mindset is the story I just told you. You know, what is the critical RNA that may be binding to enolase and uh, or what are the RNAs that enolase binds to and regulate them sort of in the traditional sense? That's of course also possible. We didn't know. So we conducted um, these uh, so-called uh, CLIP experiments, in this case eClip for the specialists. And what CLIP experiments are is you do UV cross-linking once again, but this time you have a specific antibody against your protein of interest, so against enolase. You pull out enolase with it, the RNAs that are specifically cross-linked to it, and then you sequence them. And you're curious what comes out. Well, in the case of enolase, this came out. Um, what you see is a big cloud of gray dots, uh, all of which show statistically significant enrichment over negative controls. And this is about 2,000 dots. So not one volt RNA, 2,000 dots. And uh, you can see that six of them uh, we labeled. And the point I'd like to... Um, you to, to, to see here in particular is that basically all six are not taken from extreme positions but are taken from sort of within the cloud. And so uh, she first validated uh, these targets as she called them um, and you can see them here and the way it was validated was she did an immunoprecipitation and then uh, by qPCR uh, uh, compared uh, specific immunoprecipitation with IgG uh, precipitation with primers against these, and you can see that indeed all six of them are validated. And then she took um, RNAs of at least equal abundance in the cell that were not amongst those 2,000, and they are here, and they were negative. So clearly, although there are 2,000 binders, there is some level of specificity. And what does it mean to have so many interacting with enolase 1? Well, you kind of look what's binding. Is it non-coding RNAs? Is it, uh, you know, your fantasy, um, you know, has many options. Uh, but this is what the data say. Basically, the binders show that the vast majority of the binders are from mature messenger RNAs about any re region of the messenger RNA. Seems to be mature messenger RNA because there was very little in terms of intronic sequences. And there are some non-coding RNAs, but again, these are relatively small compared to the total. So mature cytoplasmic mRNA. When you look at what do they encode, does it mean something, can you make a story out of it? At least we weren't smart enough to come up with a great story behind this. So what to do? Well, what Ina did is, uh, you know, you saw um, the, amongst the six dots were three black and three green. And the three green were the ones uh, which we used for uh, further follow-up studies. And those were sequences from the 5' UTR of three different uh, messenger RNAs that are indicated here. And they were just meant to be, you know, representative examples. And from these, here you can see sort of a generic uh, plot um, of the iClip assay. This is the specific ino one immunoprecipitation. You see some signal. This is the input control, and you can see the background. And you can see that in particular for this region here, there is a lot of signal in the specific and hardly any in the background. So we call this a specific binding region. And so Ina made synthetic 35 nucleotide oligomers of those regions. And this is called specific target. And then from the same messenger RNAs, 
She looked for a region, and there were many, where there was little signal and little background. So these were the control sites. And she always chose those control RNAs, also 35 nucleotides long, so that the GC content between the two was about the same. And she first did band shift assays. So in other words, a biochemical uh, testing evaluation of the specificity of binding on a native gel. Labeling, making a, one of the RNAs uh, as a radioactive probe, then adding um, you know, the recombinant protein, which shifts it up here, and then titrating in increasing amounts of cold RNA, of cold RNA exactly corresponding to the probe, and as you would predict, that competes and you reaccumulate the hot probe down here. If you now take the control RNA as a competitor, rather than the specific target RNA, there's no such competition. And so she repeated this experiment with the others and determined uh, you know, binding constants. And you can see here that uh, you know, the binding to the specific compared to the non-specific controls is more than two orders of magnitude different. Again, indicating that there is a high degree of specificity of binding, even though there are many different target sites, it seems. It's not just any odd RNA. Okay, but what does it mean? So, um, because in the lab at the time, you know, the P62 project that I told you about was progressing, so of course uh, Ina also wondered, might the RNA do something to the enzyme? And so one of the questions she was wondering about is, you know, uh, enolase 1 has 2-phosphoglycerate as its substrate if you go down in glycolysis, um, and phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP, is the um, product, or since this is a reversible reaction, it can go in both directions. Immediately um, above, closer to glucose, is a 3-phosphoglycerate, which is not a substrate of enolase 1, and 3-phosphoglycerate and 2-phosphoglycerate have the identical molecular mass. So this made for a fantastic negative control for the experiment I'm showing you here. So this is now a band shift experiment where not RNA is used as a competitor, but the metabolite is used as a competitor. And the question was asked, can the metabolites and the RNA you know, compete for, for each other? And so what you see is the band shift uh, experiment here, and the specific uh, substrate of the forward reaction is added, and you can see signal goes down, uh, or you use the substrate of the reverse reaction, PEP, and you can see there is nice competition, or you use 3-phosphoglycerate, which is, you know, as I said, the ideal control in a way, and you can see there is no such competition. So the conclusion was that substrates, metabolites, and RNA binding seem to be in a competitive uh, relationship, at least be mutually con uh, exclusive. Does that affect enolase as an enzyme? So the next logical step was the experiment I'm showing here. It's a very simple experiment, like you do in biochemistry in the, in the first class. You have pure enzyme, you add the substrate, and you measure you know, the enzymatic uh, reaction, and that is plotted here. And now we would add either the specific RNA or control RNA to the enzymatic reaction. And you can see here that when the control RNA is added, one of the examples, there's absolutely no difference, no effect, compared to no RNA added. But when we add the specific RNA target, you can see that it inhibits um, the enzyme. You use the second or the third of these uh, three green examples, and you see exactly the same. So what this established then is that at least in vitro, RNA riboregulates the glycolytic function of enolase 1, which is nice, but as biologists, we're obviously interested in what happens in cells in real life. So the next experiment that Ina did was she used mouse embryonic stem cells, undifferentiated mouse embryonic stem cells in culture, and she used uh, nucleofaction to either introduce the unspecific 35 MERS 
or the specific binders, and then measure lactate accumulation in the media as a readout for glycolysis. And what you can see is that while the unspecific RNAs don't touch uh, you know, lactate accumulation, three out of the three specific binders inhibit glycolysis uh, under those conditions, or at least lactate accumulation. So that then indicated that at least when you introduce supraphysiological amounts of binding RNA into cells, you can inhibit glycolysis in this novel way, which may, and I'm not going to head in that direction for the rest of the talk, open up some new therapeutic approaches to controlling glycolysis, which is obviously an important pathway. But in any case, this, w this isn't a physiology experiment. Uh, you know, this is a molecular biology experiment. And so in order to explore physiology, we state with the mouse embryonic stem cells. And um, as many of you will know, they are kept in the undifferentiated state by the presence of leukemia inhibitory factor live in the media. When you culture them in this way, they will stay undifferentiated for a long time. Oops, sorry. Um, but when you withdraw live from the media, over a time course of about a week, they start what is called spontaneous differentiation. For a developmental biologists, it's not the greatest model. You know, for us, it uh, you know, served us uh, well for, for, for the moment. Because what we knew was that when you um, allow this uh, spontaneous differentiation to happen, that glycolysis goes down and respiration picks up. That was in the literature. So we wondered, does this well-known phenomenon have anything to do with riboregulation of enolase 1 activity? So the first thing that we did is we just measured that when glycolysis is going down, what happens to the RNA binding activity of enolase 1 by the so-called PNK assay. I'm not going to explain it now. It's, it's not critical. And you can see that indeed, while um, glycolysis is going down, enolase, uh, uh, enolase RNA binding activity goes up. So at least that is, in a correlative way, consistent with the RNA inhibiting the enzyme. But of course, this is just an inverse correlation, and there could be many. So taking the next step, uh, Ina, uh, first of all, um, you know, introduced some more time points. And then she actually looked at specific targets rather than general RNA binding. And that's shown on this slide here. And you can see that, you know, at the, whoops, at the beginning, um, you know, there's in pluripotent cells, there's relatively low RNA binding activity. And then after three days, not very much happens. But as of day five, and in particular after seven days, you know, basically for all of the targets to different degrees, um, RNA binding picks up, um, and the negative controls stay negative. Okay, so what that then shows is that the RNA binding activity of enolase is regulated during differentiation. Whether that is purposeful or not, this experiment doesn't say, but at least it's regulated. And we wondered what might be the driver of this differentiation-induced change in RNA binding. We tried many different things, and I'm you know, cutting to the chase, and this is a very simple experiment um, uh, that Ina did, actually on HeLa cells. And uh, she treated HeLa cells, amongst other things, this is the experiment that worked well, um, with uh, sodium butyrate. Sodium butyrate is a very non-specific or broad specificity, you could say, HDAC inhibitor, Heston deacetylase inhibitor, or protein deacetylase inhibitor, rather. And what we saw, what she saw is, you can see here a Western blot um, just showing that in an immunoprecipitation experiment of ENO1, about the same amounts were precipitated. And then, uh, you know, the immunoprecipitated uh, enolase 1 was uh, probed 
with an antibody against acetyl lysine. And you can see that as you titrate in the inhibitor of HDEX, that acetylation of uh, enolase 1 increases, which sort of is a prediction if enolase is an acetylated protein. But the remarkable part is up here. This is a PNK assay that looks at enolase's RNA binding activity. And you can see that as um, acetylation increases, so does the RNA binding of enolase. This, for those of you who think in epigenetic terms, you're more used to increased acetylation, meaning less nucleic acid binding. Um, so I'm just pointing out in, the, in this particular biological instance, increased acetylation means increased RNA binding activity. And that was tested in the experiment that I showed to you before. And what we could see is that uh, it's easiest to look at the numbers of multiple experiments, that as cells undergo differentiation, indeed the um, acetylation of uh, enolase 1 uh, also increases. Again, an interesting correlation, no more, no less. So how can we go from correlation to function? And the successful approach is summarized on this slide. What we decided to do is that we needed mutants of the enolase protein. Mutants that would have reduced RNA binding activity, and that is a, um, a protein that is called here ENO1 down. And we also, and that was uh, more a lucky hit, uh, it wasn't something we were aiming for, but most happy to get in our mutagenesis experiment. We also ended with a mutant that shows increased RNA binding activity that we called ENO1 you know, up. And the important thing here, these are, I, I will reveal the mutations in a moment. Um, these are either a triple amino acid change or a single amino acid change. And what is, of course, important is that when you want to manipulate the RNA binding activity specifically, that the enzymatic activity per se should not be affected by the mutagenesis. So we made uh, recombinant versions of all of these in E. coli and tested of the naked proteins, um, you know, the enzymatic parameters. And you can see that for the wild type, the increased RNA binding mutant and the decreased RNA binding mutant, the enzymatic parameters are unaltered. But when we measure RNA binding using the PNK assay in HeLa cells, you know, while the wild type is set at one, the up mutant has about two to two and a half fold increase in RNA binding, while the down mutant has about a three fold decrease in RNA binding. So now we had fantastic tools. We used them, we engineered using CRISPR-Cas, uh, these enolase mutants into the genome of mouse embryonic stem cells as the only enolases that these cells would have. And we could now test what happens, if anything, to differentiation. And that you can see here. So we measured um, you know, we allowed seven days of spontaneous differentiation and then measured marker genes, um, you know, of the different, um, you know, um, marker genes for the different germ layers. And uh, you can see here the wild type. You can see a particular sort of thick red um, uh, rectangle around the green dots. Those are the endoderm markers. And you can see that particularly for the endoderm markers, in the ENO1-UP mutant that has forced increased RNA binding, there is a decrease in their expression. And in the ENO1-DOWN mutant, there is an increase in the um, endoderm marker gene expression. So what this experiment says, you know, with, uh, with a little more distance, is it appears as if riboregulation of enolase 1 is important for proper mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation to occur. And since we know that in cell differentiation and in cancer biology, this metabolic remodeling between glycolysis, 
aerobic glycolysis and respiration is an important aspect. We are now exploring to what extent this form of riboregulation applies to those cases. So let me show you the model of how we are putting this together. Um, so what you see here is uh, just picked from the um, PDB database. It's not our work. Um, the uh, structure of uh, enolase 1. And uh, what I've uh, uh, highlighted, or Ina has highlighted in here, are actually the mutants that we made uh, and something else that I'll explain. So up here, you see uh, you know, three lysines, um, 89, 92, and 105. And those three lysines were mutated into alanines in the case of the ENO1-UP mutant. You can also see this lysine 343, which is actually very close uh, to the catalytic center of the enzyme, which is here. And this lysine is the lysine that we changed to alanine in the RNA binding down mutant, which seems to say that RNA appears to bind close to the catalytic center, which makes sense in the context of all the experiments um, that I presented to you. And then I've highlighted here sort of a loop um, in blue, uh, which is sort of a little bit covering over the catalytic center. And I'd like to say what I'm showing to you here is not structural work that we have done, but it's our working model. This model may very well be wrong with regard to the detail that I'm presenting now, and we are doing structural work now uh, sort of to really find out the truth. But this is our model for now. So when um, you know, uh, the, the, um, these three lysines here are not acetylated, meaning um, you know, there's low RNA binding activity, we surmise that this is the structure of enolase and that you know, RNA cannot readily bind uh, to its binding region, while substrates and products can easily get in and out. We call this the door is closed for RNA and the enzyme is active. As differentiation proceed, proceeds, and I showed to you that this uh, goes along with the uh, increase in acetylation, these three lysines become acetylated. We know from mass spec experiments that at least one of them is uh, acetylated. We do not know in detail yet which one and whether it's only one, um, to just add that detail. But we know that acetylation happens here. And now our conjecture is that this may influence, you know, this blue loop here and kind of swing it out, making this region accessible to RNA binding. And I showed you experimentally that when RNA binds, it inhibits enzymatic function. Now, I also want to point out that from the experiments that I showed to you, it appears that here it is not just one RNA that's binding and not just three that we have usually used as our models, but, you know, maybe 2,000. And so the idea here in terms of the biology and the physiology is uh, what we call crowd controlling, for lack of a better term we could come up with. We think that the cell's cytosolic transcriptome, presumably the part that is not engaged in translation, not engaged with ribosomes, has so many binding sites in total that there is always enough RNA to bind to the enzyme when it is acetylated and the door is open. In other words, regulation doesn't happen through up or down regulating the RNA that binds, as in the first case, but regulation occurs on the enzymatic level, letting RNA get in or out and do its job. Um, so, almost in closing, I want to uh, touch another aspect. All the work that I've presented to you is work done on cultured cells. And so one worry, one shouldn't worry too much in science, but one should be self-critical 
that's a difference, but uh, the, you know, a small one. Um, and uh, and so one worry that one could have is maybe what we what I presented to you is something that's relevant in culture itself, but what about you know real living bees, humans, mouse, whatever. So what we then decided to do is that we needed to adapt RNA interactome capture, which I explained to you at the beginning, to being able to examine biopsy specimen or you know, animal tissues. Um, and although the original technique was published in 2012, um, you know, nobody had done this, not us, not anyone else. So the solution, and the problem is, of course, UV penetration. Um, and so, the, you know, the solution is really quite simple. So we, we took mouse uh, uh, organs, three, the brain, kidney, and liver. Uh, we froze them in liquid nitrogen and then made cryosections of uh, 30 micrometer thickness. And those are well penetratable by UV light. So then we just did the normal protocol as I explained it to you, you know, subjected things to mass spec as I explained it to you, and gained insight into the RNA binding proteins of these three organs. Here you can see a summary. So from the kidney, we identified 1,300 RBPs. From the liver, just uh, you know, a number relatively close by, a few fewer. And from the brain, just half. I don't have the time to go into this. This, paper, this work is on BioArchive at the moment. Um, but um, you know, why would brain only have half? It is not, and that's what the additional data say, because you know, the other half is not expressed at the protein level in those cells, or is expressed as a much lower protein level. That's not the case. There does seem to be an organ level regulation of RNA binding activity, and we don't know at the moment what it means. But with relevance to the subject of the talk early on, we were very interested in looking at whether enzymes, metabolic enzymes, also show this RNA binding behavior in organs as we had observed in cultured cells. And to our delight, it turns out, here's organs, here's cultured cell lines, um, that in fact it's even more prominent, the binding of organ enzymes, metabolic enzymes to RNA is even more prominent in organs than it is in cultured cells, with two notable exceptions down here. And these two notable exceptions are enzymes, um, you know, belonging to oxidative phosphorylation or to glutathione metabolism. We don't know why that is, but one thought that we have is that it might have to do with the supra-physiological oxygen concentrations that we have in our cell culture um, cabinets uh, compared to physiological oxygen levels in organs. We don't know whether that's true, but to us that is a plausible thought to have. And just to give you a couple of examples in finishing, you can see here, uh, you know, green dots again mean uh, RNA binding found in any of the three uh, um, organs uh, that I mentioned, brain, liver, kidney, and you can see a lot of green around the TCA cycle, uh, amino acid metabolism links, uh, fatty acid metabolism, and, uh, and so forth. Um, and so there is a lot, we think, uh, to be explored. So the, the rest couple of slides in terms of summary, putting it all together, um, the first example that I summarized was P62 or sequestrosome 1, which is important in autophagy. And here, the RNA ligand was a single RNA. Uh, the regulation, the biological regulation, happened at the level of controlling the expression levels of the RNA. And the effect of the RNA was blocking the oligomerization of the protein. A totally different form of riboregulation applies to enolase 1. Here, it seems that there are some 2,000 mostly messenger RNAs that can bind. 
Here, regulation does not occur by changing RNA levels, but it, it appears to be by controlling RNA access to the protein, presumably, or at least in part, controlled by uh, acetylation. And the effect of the RNA in riboregulation is to block enzymatic function. I think there is a lot more possibilities one can think of. We have some projects ongoing in the lab on other proteins, and um, I'm reasonably confident that uh, there will be some other, and also, once again, different and in part similar examples to share in the future. So this is the further step back. So when we think about the world of RNA binding proteins, we have the transacting factor RNA binding proteins that, that, that control RNA fate. We have uh, RNA binding proteins as components of RNP machines. We all know very well the ribosome, the spliceosome, your CRISPR-Cas complex, RIS complex, you know, what have you. And I'm suggesting that perhaps not the smallest part of the uh, RNA binding protein world may uh, occur as targets of uh, riboregulation, even if today I only shared two examples. I should also point out that while maybe these are the first examples where, um, let's say, the biological concept was, uh, was discussed uh, in, in, in exactly this context, it's certainly not the first examples of proteins whose functions are controlled by direct RNA binding. And in particular, if you think of innate immunity, toll-like receptors, if you think of um, you know, PKR, uh, the kinase that phosphorylates uh, initiation factor 2 alpha, um, you know, there, is ex there are examples in the literature that with hindsight you know, fall exactly under this um, same concept. So with this I finish, uh, you know, I want to thank the members of my team who have uh, contributed uh, to this work. Um, Ina Hoppertz is really the main person uh, who did the work on enolase. She is now a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Cologne. Um, the work on uh, P62 uh, is work uh, done by uh, Rusty Horos and uh, Maggie Bücher. Um, the work with the, with the organs um, is a uh, collaboration with Bruno Galli, who is now at the German Cancer Research Center, and Joel Perez Perry. These are co collaborators who have contributed to different parts. And um, yeah, I thank you very much once again for the fantastic invitation, for your attention, and I'd be most happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, very much for stressing again that actually RNA is the most interesting and important molecule. Yeah, I hope students want to study it more and more. And first, before we open the uh, questions, I would like to present you with uh, uh, Johann Gregor Mendel. Oh, wow. Medal. And I didn't this expect is a this. Beautiful. And also a certificate that... Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much again for the question. So, thank you. So, please, questions. Hi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I wanted. I have like two questions. One of it is. Uh, I don't know if I heard correctly or not. So enolase is supposed to be a glycolytic protein. So it's supposed to be in the cytosol. But uh, you found it binding in RNA. Is there uh, some mechanism uh, on how the protein is shuttling? Or is uh, the protein that is connecting, which is binding the RNA, is de novo produced to go into the nucleus? Or is it the RNA that is being transported somewhere? OK. So, um, as I try to explain, the RNA that enolase appears to bind is mature messenger RNA. And as you know, uh, you know, after transcription, messenger RNA in the nucleus is processed to become mature and is then exported to the cytoplasm. 
So RNA and protein are in the same place, namely in the cytoplasm. And in fact, while that's what we would expect from the textbooks, we actually even have done microscopy experiments using a um, proximity ligation assay where we can see this particular RNA protein interaction that I reported on happening in the cytoplasm of cells. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. The second one I have is uh, about the differentiation. Uh, my question is, is if uh, your group tried to see which uh, type of differentiation is impaired or not. So if it's uh, an impairment on mesoderm differentiation or ectoderm differentiation, if, if uh, all the, dif the, the specifications are uh, impaired or not. Uh, I think this is a really important and relevant question. And, and, and in a friendly way, it points out that the experiment that I shared with you is a very crude experiment. Um, because uh, basically we harvested after seven days what was left on the dish um, and then in the total population measured markers. Um, these experiments can be done in far more refined ways. So there's nice sublines that express fluorescent proteins under uh, the control of certain differentiation markers. So you can sort in a, in, a, in a cell sorter, the different lineages, and then compare those uh, you know, in the different settings. So these are all really nice experiments that one should do, but we haven't done yet, but we will do them. So for the moment, I cannot answer to you whether every germ layer's path uh, requires the riboregulation or whether you know, some are more affected and some may not be affected at all. Good question, yeah. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, so I also have a question uh, regarding a differentiation experiment. So you said uh, before that uh, there's uh, around six um, different uh, messenger RNAs which uh, can bind to this enzyme. And did you check what happens of protein level of these messenger RNAs during differentiation, and is could this be maybe some like coevolution between uh, like enzyme and uh, RNA, and then the day like uh, if suddenly, for example, this RNA is needed uh, during differentiation and stopped being needed. That yes. So this is a. Uh, interesting question because uh, I guess what you are implying, and I would agree, that in principle regulation could actually be bidirectional. Uh, you know, you could be controlling the activity of the enzyme, but at the same time, the protein could control the expression of the RNAs. Um, you, you did mention six, and I just want to make sure. Everybody understands that those six were just chosen as examples that we've looked into in more detail. There's no reason for us to believe that those six are you know, special over the other 2,000 uh, you know, that are specific minus, just for clarity. Um, but in any case, so we did the exp an experiment uh, that you are asking, uh, which is uh, we knocked down enolase and then looked at the transcriptome, and we looked by ribosome profiling at the translational fate of the target genes and the rest. Mm -hmm. And basically, although we could confirm that the knockdown was very effective, um, basically in the transcriptome, you know, the, the, the biggest change was actually enolase one, which we had knocked down. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, from that viewpoint, um, you could say it was either disappointing or it was fantastic. We saw no differences in terms of the um, uh, ribosome occupancy or of steady state levels or of alternative splicing patterns to the degree that one can look at alternative splicing patterns in a transcriptome. So we could find no evidence uh, you know, for the other direction of regulation. Okay. Pavel? Uh, sorry, uh, I have just a short one. Uh, so you use sodium butyrate to uh, block the HDAC. Though, did you try out 
trichostatin A, which would be clearly more nuclear, and you wouldn't see eventually uh, acetylation of your enolase, whether you are still seeing the RNA binding, let's say RNA mediated switch of the function of the enzyme? Sorry, I heard you say, did you try, and then I didn't catch uh, up. Did you try to use another HDAC blocker, like TSA or something like that, like trichostatin A? Oh, we, we used other pharmacological agents. I should also say, um, although I'm, I'm blocking out which it is, it is in the paper, uh, we identified even the deacetylase uh, behind it, and when you knock it down, uh, you know, you see the... Uh, it, respective effects, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we um, validated, if you want. Yeah, because the, I was wondering how yeah. much the overall transcription increase by using an HDAC blocking uh, approach is going to affect your NLA's readout outcome because you have more yeah. RNA to bind. Yeah, so, um, y you know, HDAC was, uh, the sorry, um, butyrate was uh, sort of, you know, a striking simple experiment that I shared. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, we followed that up with, uh, you know, slightly finer tools, uh, including, uh, you know, manipulating the expression levels of the deacetylase itself uh, that is responsible for, for, for deacetylation here. Mm -hmm. Can I go? Matthias, fantastic talk, really, really clear. I have a tough question, okay, about evolution, because we are talking here about the deeply conserved glycolytic uh, enzymes and about, you know, you know, broad specificity interaction with many RNA species, right? So, you know, what, what can you speculate about, you know, how, how did this evolve? Because it seems like a very you know, fundamental interaction between the protein and RNA world, right? And, and you know, what, what, what do you think was the, you know, what, what was the driving force to establish this level of regulation? Um, I think, I mean, first, let me take one step back. Uh, so we are talking here about interactions that I claim to be specific and that I claim to be biologically relevant of proteins that don't have architectural domains evolved to bind RNA. Yes. For me, um, this was something that worried me at the very beginning until I realized that in the 1990s, you know, a te you know technologies were developed, uh, you know, the Celex experiments. You know, what you do in a Celex experiment is, uh, you know, you take a protein or you even take a drug, a, a chemical compound, and you evolve RNAs that bind whatever your bait is with high specificity and good affinity. And what that shows is that something that, you know, RNA, when we think about RNA or when we think about nucleic acids, but in particular about RNA, we think a lot about the hydrogen bonding and about the specificity that comes from hydrogen bonding. I think we think relatively little about the structural plasticity that RNA has that you can effectively evolve um, specific binders uh, over time. So that's part one of my answer. Okay. Part two of my answer is that, um, you know, as biology in evolution sort of drives forward, and I, you know, this may be total bullshit, and please tell me anyone, you know, if you disagree, I'd be happy to learn from you. Uh, but at least the way I'm thinking about this is, um, you know, as evolution kind of moves uh, closer to our times, um, you know, of course you have a lot of potential to evolve binders, um, you know, as, you know, the junk transcription that suddenly obtains a function, uh, you know, in non-coding regions where you don't change the coding potential of RNA, etc., etc. So there's easy space for RNA to evolve uh, new functions without changing functions it has already acquired. Um, and I think as the need for biological regulation occurs, for me, you know, becoming more and more complex is acquiring the ability to regulate. Um, and so for me, this could 
have been quite a primordial way of early regulation in a world that didn't require much more than RNA and protein. You know, requires no modification enzymes in principle, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know whether that makes sense to you, but I'm happy yeah. to hear one uh, dissenting views. One good hi hypothesis or maybe it's story, right? Because that's, it's very hard to show these kind of things. Right? Yeah. But uh, what I was thinking maybe also is whether there would be some conflict between the protein and the RNA world, you know, maybe centered on the metabolites or something like that, right? That we, we see like a remnant of, of some kind of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, antagonism, you know, between those two worlds. But that is even more speculative than what yeah. you said. So. Yeah, I must say I haven't had the privilege so far to discuss this with somebody who is really kind of an evolutional, evolutionary biologist. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here, I have a question. You basically propose the mechanism where uh, enzymatic activity is regulated by sequestering the pool of the enzyme in cytoplasmic RNA. And now, you know, why not to degrade? So it suggests that it's reversible. Do you have any idea, you know, how to turn on the analyze on, basically by removing from RNA and, you know, activate it again? I, I, w I mean, first of all, when you look at the, you know, dissociation constant, the biochemical parameters, you know, this is a, I think this is a constant, bi you know, binding and, 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 and unbinding and rebinding, etc. And so, uh, you know, if you change RNA access in this uh, process by changing acetylation in the model that we have, um, like I said, I hope relatively soon we get some structural information. Uh, you know, that for me would explain the reversibility and, 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 a, and a capacity uh, you know, to change the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Ma Matthias? Um, I was constantly puzzled during your talk. You say it's specific, but then it's still, for the physiological role, it would still be very much concentration dependent because what you see is, I think you showed low micromolar binding. So one question would be, uh, what's the concentration of enolase in the cell? and the RNAs that you have there. And the other question would be, you showed these enolase mutants. They don't differ in Vmux, but they differ in, in, uh, in the uh, KM, and therefore it's again an affinity uh, that changes, and that should again have an effect on how much of a concentration you choose for doing this experiment. So, um, and the third thing was, if you think about all these concentration dependencies, there's also, did you do any of these measurements in crowded, in a crowded environment, or did you change the crowding to see how, how that affects the, the, the results? Okay, so um, maybe I'll start with the first part of your question, which I uh, sort of translate for myself into when you take the um, concentration of the protein and you take, uh, you know, the concentration of RNA binding sites uh, in the cell, you know, do the two concentrations match in such a way that, you know, they are plausible, that, that it plausibly fits what I'm saying here. Yes, 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 in, yes. In, in, so in so that's, that's precisely, um, you know, what, uh, a reviewer uh, asked. No, no, no. The, it's a beautiful. It's a. It's a beautiful question because it's. It's important, right? And uh, you know. It, you know. If you. If you submit a paper, and uh, you know. You. You have something where, as a. You know, I'm a trained medical doctor, as was said. You know, as a stupid medical doctor, you think this makes a lot of sense, and the data point in that direction. And then you have a real enzymologist, who points or asks a question that points out. The whole thing just doesn't jive from an uh, enzymology viewpoint. You don't want to publish that paper because you will look like an utter fool uh, eventually when this, you know, somebody realizes this. So having said that, you know, we did all of the back of the envelope calculations um, and were very relieved to see that this actually fits quite beautifully. Um, so that was the first part of your question. Second part of your question had to do with, uh, with uh, you know, um, um, uh, KM. Um, again, I'm not an enzymologist, uh, and, uh, and 
Yeah, mm -hmm. if you measure binding, then you have a reduction of a factor of three, but you have also a reduction or increase of factor of three in Km. And Km is the inverse. Well, uh, what, what, what we would say is, uh, you know, there are no, um, um, you know, significant uh, differences uh, between those, unfortunately, and maybe, maybe your, your criticism really is we should have done a few more measurements uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, the range of the measurements we, we did with the down mutant, that's what you're referring to, right? Are you referring to the down mutant? I, I ref you said that the, the RNA binding changes, and this is significant, right? While the, yes. By the kinetic, the speed, the maximum speed does not change. Uh, that's true, but the Km changes, and the Km is the measure of affinity, and uh, that changes by a factor of three, two. Are you talking about the Km of the enzymatic reaction? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I would read those numbers as a lack of change, um, because, uh, you know, these three numbers that you see along the row, uh, you know, clearly are not significantly different from one another. But what I'm saying is, I take your, I take your criticism because you know, lack of significance obviously does not mean you know, maybe your measurements were just too far apart and then everything lacks uh, significance. So I, I, I'll take your point um, and maybe we have to do a few more measurements um, um, of this. We can discuss later. Yeah, happily. Uh -huh. Okay, hello. Uh you were showing that the analyze binds to major mRNA, and the major mRNA rarely uh, travels around the cell naked without any protein binding to it preliminary. So do you have any idea if there are some protein interactions between the proteins that are bind bound to the mRNA already and the analyze? Okay, so uh, I definitely, don't think of cytosolic or any form of RNA as ever being naked and not accompanied by, by proteins. That's definitely not what I'm thinking. Um, but your question, I guess, might mean do some proteins that are in contact with some of the RNAs that we see bind, uh, those proteins maybe proteins that have protein-protein interaction with enolase and that way increase the likelihood of binding, is that your question? Or they may be the specificity mm -hmm. between the mRNAs that are binding to the analyze and those that are not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, so we've done um, um, mass spec experiments on, protein mass spec experiments on IPs of enolase, uh, you know, with regard to that and then looked at you know, what, in what one pulls down, whether there were sort of interesting and informative RNA binding proteins. It's not, the outcome wasn't something that made us exciting as an avenue to pursue. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't say that if somebody else had looked at it, uh, you know, there might not be something in it. I like, I like your in principle idea. You know, I don't think the model calls for that being necessary but I could see how what you're proposing you know, might contribute to, to what I reported. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, did you think in the RNA as a platform to concentrate all the enzymes of one particular enzymatic pathway so they can work together better? So that is also an interesting question. There is a literature of, uh, you know, so-called enzymatic factories, um, uh, you know, where, you know, a series of enzymes actually in glycolysis and in other metabolic pathways uh, kind of form uh, subcellular complexes. And so I understand your question to be, could RNA be a tether uh, that brings together such complexes and in such a way maybe be riboregulation that positively drives, uh, you know, pathways forward as opposed to the inhibitory example that I gave here. So the answer is that's absolutely part of the theoretical concept and absolutely something that we have in mind when we think about, you know, RNA binding enzymes as a whole. 
uh, but it's not uh, something um, that we have uh, explored. I am aware of work uh, done um, by, a, by a group in Ireland um, that has looked at um, you know, um, uh, PKM2, so uh, pyruvate kinase, the last enzyme in the, in the glycolytic pathway, and, and, and its um, interactions um, with, uh, no, I've forgotten. Uh, you know, it's, it's branching, it's bran I don't know whether it's, um, I don't know whether it's lactate dehydrogenase, you can see it's a, it's a vague memory. In any case, RNAs treatment of uh, the IP, um, you know, before the IP. So you take the cells, you either RNA treat or you not RNA treat, and then do the IP of the protein. RNA treatment affected the co IPing of neighboring enzymes. So that would support thinking along the lines of what you asked. It's very thinkable, very possible. Hi, thank you, very nice talk. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, is it possible to check the, uh, the data from the initial experiment with the 1,000 plus uh, previously not described RNA binding partners? Uh, is it available somewhere to check if some ah, of uh, our favorites <laughs> maybe yeah. are well, there? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking. So, uh, because um, so the, the biocomputational members in my group have gone through a fair amount of effort to put together a small database they call RBP Base, um, and it's uh, yeah it's available uh, through the internet. Um, I guess when you Google RBP Base, uh, you should find it. Um, you know we've published a couple of reviews on the topic overall. You know like this. Um, um, Brave New World of RNA Binding Proteins uh, that we did that is uh, fairly frequently cited. That has all the references to, to RBP base. Thank you very much. So maybe I dare to ask the last question. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, some parasitic organisms have so-called glycosomes that, uh, that encapsulate uh, the glycolytic pathway so they would be protected from the interaction of, with the mRNAs because that they don't include ribosomes. Do you think this could be a protection from this uh, kind of... A Regulation? Hmm. Um, I, I, I guess yes is a reasonable <laughs> answer um, based on the question you ask, uh, but I have no information um, on it. I'm also not suggesting even that, um, you know, yeast enolase is regulated in the same way, although we know that yeast enolase binds RNA, as I reported. We simply haven't checked that. Uh, so, how deep or shallow in evolution this mechanism even applies to analase, we haven't explored. It, there it was a thought uh, following Pavel's question about the evolutionary yeah, aspects. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, um, you know, uh, when you do this kind of work, there's so many possibilities of what you could and should explore. Um, but, uh, you know, Ina only has uh, two hands. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you very much again for an excellent thank talk. Thank you.